Juror in Oath Keeper's trial reveals secrets from the deliberation room. Jurors in the recently concluded trial of six Oath Keeper affiliates were horrified by a defense attorney's effort to provoke his autistic client into a breakdown on the witness stand, one of those jurors said Tuesday in a newly released interview. A woman who helped decide the fate of the six defendants sat last week for a 90-minute interview with C-SPAN her employer of 32 years just two days after the jury completed its work. She provided extraordinary details about the tense closed-door deliberations that resulted in four defendants being convicted of obstructing Congress for their role in the January 6 attack on the Capitol. Identified only as Ellen, the juror told C-SPAN founder Brian Lamb that several members of the jury cried in the courtroom while they watched one of those defendants, William Isaacs, take the stand under grilling from his own attorney. The jury interpreted the strategy as a stunt designed to accentuate Isaacs' struggle with autism, she said. His defense attorney tried to get him to fall apart by yelling at him and not letting him wear his headset, Ellen recalled. He was torturing his client to get us to feel sympathy. What was worse, the juror recalled, was that the judge ultimately instructed the jury not to consider Isaac's autism as a defense against his potential crimes, which meant the entire spectacle had been a waste of time. The result of the jury's six day deliberations was a conviction of four defendants, including Isaac's, on all of the charges they faced. A fifth defendant, Benny Parker, was convicted of one felony count and a misdemeanor but acquitted of other charges, and a sixth, Michael Green, was convicted of a single misdemeanor charge and acquitted of several others. Jurors rarely provide public commentary about their service, especially not to the detailed degree that Ellen did in her C-SPAN interview. She revealed that she worked with Lamb for more than 30 years and agreed to sit with him after he contacted her following the trial. The result was an eye-opening look at the jury's lengthy deliberations the fault lines, the close calls and the persuasion efforts that resulted in guilty verdicts on most of the counts. Isaac's attorney, Charles Green, acknowledged that most of the jury recoiled at his posture toward his autistic client. It was all by design, he said, because he viewed acquittal as possible only if the jury could see Isaac's profound struggle. The strategy was the jury's going to hate me, but usually when you kick a puppy, the jury hates the person who kicks the puppy but they have sympathy for the puppy, Green told Politico. He said that he had prepped for the testimony for days, running it by Isaac's family to ensure it wouldn't cause a medical episode, but said he didn't warn Isaac's because he needed his client's response to be genuine. We had to wing it. He couldn't be prepared for it. He couldn't know what was coming, Green said. I was crying. I didn't like doing it. The days leading up to it, just thinking about it, it was traumatic for me too. I had to do it in a way that came across as heartless. Ellen indicated that she and another juror who happened to be a lawyer helped spearhead a lot of the deliberations. Some jurors, she said, did not seem to have followed every twist and turn of the trial. Others, she said, seemed to have preconceived notions against convicting anyone regardless of the facts which the jury had to overcome to arrive at its verdict. And when she completed her service, after a five-week trial and lengthy deliberations, Ellen came away with a conclusion if she were ever on trial, she would waive her right to a jury and instead let the judge decide her fate. I would never want my fate in the hands of people who are mostly completely ill-equipped to understand what's going on, she said. Ellen described the extraordinary volume of evidence jurors had to sift through as they considered the 34 counts against the six defendants part of prosecutors' video evidence trove that is unparalleled in American history. She said she grew exasperated at times with some jurors' insistence that they had to rely only on direct evidence to reach a conviction, rather than circumstantial evidence that can point to someone's guilt. But despite these frustrations, she ultimately compared the experience to 12 angry men and a made-for-TV movie in which jurors understood the gravity of their charge and the significance of the case they had just witnessed. Ellen indicated that of the four defendants who took the stand three did harm to themselves by testifying. One of them, she said, was Benny Parker, whose testimony she said helped convince the jury that there was a plan to storm the Capitol even before the group arrived at the building. That testimony, she said, damaged other defendants, including Parker's wife Sandra who was convicted on several counts for which Parker who didn't enter the building was acquitted. Another defendant, Connie Meggs whose husband Kelly Meggs was convicted of seditious conspiracy in November for his January 6 actions made implausible claims on the stand that led the jury to doubt her testimony, Ellen said. Ellen saved her harshest remarks for some of the defense lawyers in the case, who she said at times acted in ways that perplexed and even upset the jury. For example, the lawyer for one defendant, Laura Steele, didn't put on a case for his client but noticeably laughed repeatedly throughout the trial, Ellen said. I was horrified, she said. As she went through each of the counts the jury considered, Ellen said the decision on convicting four defendants of obstruction of an official proceeding a felony that carries a 20-year maximum sentence was relatively easy. Did they obstruct Congress? Yes. Next, she said. What was more in dispute was how to handle the two defendants who never entered the Capitol Parker and Michael Green. Some jurors appeared convinced that only those who went inside the building could be convicted of the charge, and Ellen said she disagreed, 
citing the testimony of police officers who insisted Congress couldn't return until the entire Capitol grounds were cleared of rioters. Ultimately, Parker and Green were both acquitted of the charge, though Parker was convicted of conspiracy to obstruct Congress a result of what Ellen said was his own testimony about his thought process outside the Capitol. The jury was so divided on this, she said, noting that some had considered whether Parker should only be convicted of a misdemeanor trespassing charge. She noted that jurors were shown a long gun that Parker had stashed at a house in Virginia before traveling to Washington. Ellen insisted that the jury was focused entirely on the facts and law and did not enter the case with preconceived notions about the defendants. At times, she said, they grappled with the heartbreaking story of the Parkers, an older couple who were members of an Ohio-based militia before deciding to come to Washington with Jessica Watkins, a local Oath Keepers leader. They said they wanted to fight, but I don't think they meant that literally at first, Ellen said, adding, there was a lot of sympathy. We feel like they stumbled into something dot and quat. It was Benny Parker's interview with a foreign journalist that I think just sealed his fate, she added, noting that he told the interviewer what the mob was doing was likely illegal but there's so many of us, what could they possibly do to us dot and quat. And Parker added, we are prepared to bring arms, she recalled. Ellen said some of the jurors have kept in touch since the trial and have continued to text about developments now that they're able to read news about the case and understand the perception of their verdict. She said she was shocked that she was allowed to join the jury, given her long history at C-SPAN. She remembered thinking, how could they allow a person from the media, who their staff was in the middle of the insurrection and various television equipment was being destroyed from other networks that could have been ours. I don't even know if it was or was an apostrophe T. And quad. Ellen said she volunteered during jury selection that she worked for C-SPAN, finding it odd that she was never asked to identify an employer until the later rounds of questioning. Though three defense witnesses jumped up to question her, they ultimately agreed she could be an impartial juror. Did you want to be on the jury? Lamb asked. Yes, Ellen replied. When did you make that decision? Lamb said. When I get the summons, she added. I've always wanted to be on a jury my whole life. And quad. At 1.42 a.m. on December 19, 2020, Trump sent out the tweet with his explosive invitation. Trump repeated his big lie and claimed it was, quote, statistically impossible to have lost the 2020 election before calling for a big protest in D.C. on January 6th. Donald Trump's 1.42 a.m. tweet electrified and galvanized his supporters, especially the dangerous extremists in the Oath Keepers, the Proud Boys, and other racist and white nationalist groups spoiling for a fight against the government. Now Donald Trump is calling on his supporters to descend on Washington, D.C., January 6th. He is now calling on we, the people, to take action and to show our numbers. We're going to only be saved by millions of Americans moving to Washington, if necessary, storming right into the Capitol. After the president tweeted at me by name, calling me out the way that he did, um, the threats became much more specific, much more graphic, included members of my family, by name, their ages, our address, pictures of our home. A lot of threats. Um wishing death upon me. I won't even introduce myself by my name anymore. I get nervous when I bump into someone I know in the grocery store who says my name. I'm worried about who's listening. Telling me that, you know, I'm, I'll be in jail with my mother and saying things like, be glad it's 2020 and not 1920. I get nervous when I have to give my name for food orders. I'm always concerned of who's around me. He had a pistol and was threatening my neighbor, not with the pistol, but just vocally. When I saw the gun, I knew I had to get close. On some of these, we had a daughter who was gravely ill, who was upset by what was happening outside. So it was disturbing. It was disturbing. There's probably about 300 uh, Proud Boys. They're marching eastbound, actually on the mall, towards the United States Capitol. We met up with the Proud Boys uh, somewhere around 10.30 a.m. I was uh, confused to a certain extent why we were walking away from the president's speech, because that's what um, I felt 
we were there to cover. January 6th for the officers that responded was uniquely traumatic in that um, you had people telling them that what they experienced wasn't that bad, uh, if it had happened at all. I looked back to see what had hit him, what had happened, and that's when I got sprayed in the eyes as well. I was taken to be decontaminated by another officer, um, but we didn't get the chance because we were then tear gassed. Can you give us one memory of that awful day that stands out most vividly in your mind? There were officers on the ground, um, you know, they were bleeding, they were throwing up, they were, you know, they had, uh, I mean, I saw friends with blood all over their faces. I was slipping in people's blood. We need to hold the doors of the Capitol. I need court support. We're not going to let these people keep us from finishing our business. So we need you to get the building cleared, give us the okay so we can go back in session and finish up the people's business as soon as possible. Mr. Secretary and Senator Schumer, some people here in the Capitol Police believe it would take us several days to secure the building. Do you agree with that analysis? You know, I had supported Trump all that time. Uh, I did believe, you know, that the election was being stolen. Um, and Trump asked us to come. He called me there and he laid out what is happening in our government. He laid it out. I lost my job um, since this all happened, you know, uh, pretty much sold my house. Um, so everything that happened with the charges, you know, thank God uh, a lot of them did get dismissed because I was just holding my phone, but at the same time I was there. Um, so, I mean, it definitely, it, it changed my life, you know, uh, and not for the good. I think we've gotten exceedingly lucky that more bloodshed did not happen because the potential has been there from the start. And we got very lucky that the loss of life was, and as tragic as it is, that we saw on January 6th, the potential was so much more.